I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very honored to welcome you, cher Alexandre. Merci. Your French is perfect, I know no, that. My no, English not. is not perfect, but your but French is so good, so maybe we can do the interview in French. Si tu veux draguer avec moi, on peut draguer ici, même que ta mec est là. So, um, dear Alex, you have a very interesting and diverse background, coming from philosophy, sociology, and a German university. I don't speak German. And going to one of the most influential tech companies in the world. It's fascinating how someone with such a background in social sciences transition to successfully into tech industry. How do you explain that? Um, well, so I wrote a PhD. I, I, was, I was born into an academic family, and there was basically one choice, be an academic or, or be a failure. And I didn't, it, my family, we really, business was not viewed as an option. So I, I ended in academia the way most people end, in thing, end up doing things just because it's what I knew and I was reasonably uh, good at it. Although, um, I, it, it turned out I worked with some of the best people in the world and what I discovered was I, was better, I was, should be, go build things. And the other thing that I really remember vividly thinking was in the past you shaped the world through, um, you know, ideas and words, and I, obviously at the time this was pre the software revolution, but I really came to believe that, and believe now that the world will be shaped through the embodiment of ideas and words in software platforms, um, and that the, these platforms are so levered that in fact they will shape uh, our life uh, in a way that words used to. Um, the, but, you know, the, the time, the, the weird thing about German academia, at least at the time, was unlike what one might experience at an elite school in America now, uh, people were very, very serious about academic rigor. Uh, so the, the rigor and the kind of depth at which you had to understand ideas, not just their caricature form of the idea, uh, played a very big role. And, and then, one of the major things I've been thinking a lot about, um, and some of these ideas are on our platforms, I don't want to like, there is kind of a German ph phenomenological version of Foundry, PG, these products we built. But, but I think the thing that has been influencing me the most currently is that we have these amazingly successful products, um, but I think they're successful because we built them outside the norm of any playbook. And I, if, you, if you have, if you go deep enough into philosophy, you see that these playbooks or authors or schools, at some point they break. So, you know, and, and so, and so then. So you think your background helped you to be out of the box? Well, I mean, the primary thing that helped me be out of the box is I'm pretty far out of the box. But, then, <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I felt a lot of, uh, I felt, uh, I, felt a, I did feel a lot of kinship with, I mean, I could give you lists and lists and lists of important, especially German, to some extent French, uh, philosophers and thinkers. Um, but one of my critiques of most of them is they're actually more poetry than they look in that they explain a time period. So like, for example, you can't translate Adorno into English really because it's a time period of a time period of a time period. And what we're experiencing now across the West uh, is that the playbooks, financial playbooks, uh, the people who understand them, hardware playbooks, the people who understand hardware, political playbooks, left, right, center, um, ways in which to deal with issues, wars, crime, education, raising GDP. The old expertises really are not as helpful as you would think. And so one of the reasons why America's leaping forward is we have a much greater community of non-playbook players than any other place in the world. And so, for example, if you've built a great hardware company, that's probably not very where you want to be when you evaluate software. If you have a, a deep rigor of the political dynamics of a culture, 
you probably are getting massively manipulated by people who know a lot less, but they, yeah. so, and what's, what's super interesting about the AI revolution is almost none of the playbook rules make sense. LLMs by themselves aren't that valuable, so it's confusing people. It's like, yes, there's poetry and, and videos, but you, you can't make your, you can't get better margins, you can't rebuild your manufacturing, but actually you can if they're processed. So then it's confusing, it seems to all come from America, but then the countries that are adopting them and uh, doing the most with them, I think you're gonna find are in America and also in the Middle East. And why is that? Because it's, a, it's another thing that's very unfair. This is a highly inequitable revolution. So the rich people get much richer. The poor people in America, I do think, will have GDP growth, but it, it's, the delta is going to be very large. Then you have places that are known for innovation over hundreds of years. Europe is not participating. Um, and you have also LMs, algorithms, software. These are very different things. The ability to build a software platform that could be useful and the ability to work with LLMs, build LLMs, work with algorithms it, it, it is also completely different. The assumptions are different. For example, in hardware, basically, the value is having a community of people who are all very good. In software, the value is having the one right person. Now, that seems like a small difference, but um, almost all the ability, the, 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 the attempts to build these uh, American Silicon Valley similar uh, e ecosystems of tech largely fall apart because the people building them are soft are not software natives and then you see like Saudi Arabia Emirates other places embracing these technologies in a way that you know I wish other places in the West Europe would but they're not so um, it, it's very 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 counterintuitive and uh, and then, you know, there's this, you shouldn't, it, then there's this thing, but simultaneously, of course, just to riff on this last thing, you can't invest in things you don't know, but this is something you have to know. So, so. that drives me to my next question, um, which is kind of a tricky question, which also concerns me and concerns a lot of people here. If we think about privacy, ethics on one side and growth on the other side, there seems to be a controversy here. I would like to understand how Palantir navigates the challenges posed by those opposing priorities and finds balance. Well, it, there's, there's, you know, Palantir started 20 years ago, so there's different phases. The core Intel product deals with privacy issues by removing the contradiction by exposing authorities and only authorities to the data they're allowed to see without seeing uh, the other data that they're not allowed to see. And that, but what's crazy interesting is that architecture is actually the cornerstone. We did it for the right reasons, meaning we thought expanding liberty meant fighting terrorism and fighting terrorists. So you don't get the left-right divide that, like, you know, one side wants terrorists, the other side doesn't, uh, doesn't care uh, or wants to take away your civil liberties. So the interesting thing about going deep into that problem was and if you do that, you ha need an architecture that sits on every bit of data, that has branching, that is a security model that's granular. Those are the precursors to being able to work with large language models or algorithms in a way that's not just ethical, but quite frankly, that works. Because for example, if you're sitting, just this is a completely commercial example, but it is exactly mirrors at, a, at an architectural level, the example you would have if you were sitting at an Intel service. You're sitting running a large agricultural company uh, and, um, and that, involves, that involves all sorts of things, wheat, cows, whatever, and you have to model your supply chain and your export of your product and you have to task, you have to, you have to that's influenced by weather. So you, in any enterprise you're sitting in, you're gonna have a security model you can't just outsource that tasking to any random person. You have microtasking. This person has the ability to do A, B, C, D. How do you interact with the large language model to find the satellite, to task the satellite, to task the satellite that can look for this kind of weather conditions that's cheaper and another kind of weather conditions that are more expensive without outsourcing the, the logic of your enterprise, outsourcing enough of the logic of your enterprise so the LLM understands the 
the use case without exp exp exporting so much of it that the LLM owns your use case and your business? And how do you control who sees what and when and when this tasking happens? Those are exactly the same kind of issues you have if you're running an Intel service. Who gets to see who, gets to see who this crime network? Because in that crime network, you probably have assets, you have people, meaning they work for you, you have people that you're protecting because they're an idiot, you have somebody you're trying to undermine because they're smart. These, these are architectural cornerstone issues that are vital to every enterprise in the world. And if you don't think they're vital, you, you, will, you, 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 will, you will not be able to interact with the enterprise as it's currently conceived, meaning the people managing it without paying attention to these issues. It's basically a non-starter. So the, the, the overarching thing I would also say is I'm very pro-civil liberties, but you do, you have to both augment civil liberties and augment GDP, and they're not in contradiction. Um, and what you will find is that often people who are allergic to technical issues are actually the adversaries of the Enlightenment, because if your enterprise doesn't work, your country doesn't work, and nothing can work, and mostly because you're so lazy, you're not willing to take the time to go figure out how these issues are solved technically, or you're so arrogant that you don't believe you have to understand these issues, you are actually the person yelling at me, you should be yelling at yourself. We're on the side of enlightenment. You're not on the, laziness is not, laziness and ineptitude and watching your society go over the edge is not the friend of your enterprise, your country, the betterment of human rights. And, and so, and, and it being like choosing to be a Luddite for whatever reason, because your country is not producing the tech people or because you used to, you, investing always worked this way or honestly, most importantly, because you don't like hanging out with the person who has the knowledge uh, or you're threatened by him, her. That, that, that's actually what stops the development and completely backfires. And, um, you know, I'm very proud that, uh, you know, that is the, the line between Germanic PhD level professional education and uh, what is happening across America with my product and, and presumably in other contexts. And then on the battlefield. Absolutely. So That's, I uh, would like to have, for the people here, to have a clear understanding of the contribution of Palantir and the role in Palantir in the world. If you could name one thing that you would be proud of, one well, just simple thing that would make a positive impact in the world, what would it be? Well, I'm very proud that there have been innumerable terror attacks that have been stopped in Palantir in Europe. And I would say in all modesty, if they were not stopped, you would have a very different political reality in the West. And that, that's just a fact. I, I love when I'm getting yelled at in cities in Europe. I'm like, keep yelling at me. The only reason why someone's not goose-stepping between me and you is my product. Say thank you. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, thank you. Thank yous will be accepted, will be accepted. Um, look, the, the fundamental reason for America's outperformance right now is tech. Palantir plays an enormous role on the commercial side. On the, on the, on the fighting, war fighting side, we've entered a phase where uh, real battles end, uh, happen in uh, very complicated electronic suppressed environments. You can't use old hardware in those environments anymore. Uh, you have to engage in software war and almost all uh, it, almost all useful hardware things going forward will be software enabled, software controlled, with human handoff functions. Uh, Palantir has indisputably been at the lead of that, and I think we're at the way, way beginning. I would say, from a technical perspective, the thing I am most proud and in, 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 in awe of is we've built these products that looked like kind of marginal luxury products built in part by Palantir, their madman leader, and uh, outside the norm IQ people, people didn't want to hang out with. And lo and behold, they're exactly the products everyone needs now. And you know, we, don't, we never had high sales. We, were not, we are not in conformity with whatever you've been taught you're supposed to say that you don't believe that you have to say. We've never done that. Uh, and we're winning. And winning, by the way, again, something I wish we would teach more at our elite schools, it's very important. This like, I lose and I lose and therefore I have a higher value and therefore people respect me is BS. And we don't stand for that, Palantir, at all. <laughs>
Lord. So tell me, we live in, ver in a very difficult time of wars, conflict everywhere. Palantir operates worldwide and handles critical, critically sensitive data. Could you tell us how tech companies like yours are affected by geopolitical conflict, particularly when it comes to data ownership and data privacy? By the way, I neglect to say I'm very honored to be on stage with you. Oh, come I, on. It's, uh, <laughs> yes, you people don't, may not, but like when you have a question and you need a wise answer, you're one of the first places people in the know call, and I'm very honored to be here come with on. you on stage. Thank you. Thank uh, and, you. Um, uh, um, Look, the, the core issue that companies have in the environment we're in is companies were built in a world, for a world, and the tech that they've employed have by and large been built for a world that is global and peaceful and where every day there's less violence and bigotry and you know, your supply chain is never disrupted and your primary task is to tax optimize in a rationally, a rational environment that every day gets more rational. The play, that playbook is out the door. So your, your, your products have to work in an environment where you can understand your supply chain even as it's disrupted, predict potentially disruptions, treat your, 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 your company and all of its latent assets as a portfolio under the condition that the portfolio will be very different tomorrow than it is today. Um, and that and the stress that is placed upon it uh, does presuppose robust software in your commercial environment and at war. And that that your your you know your primary duty as a leader now is to adapt is to adapt for that environment. And what does that mean? It means going to the front line and seeing do does do, do my products work? You know we do these you know boot camps where we tell everybody take everything you've done in AI prepare, do all the PowerPoints that you have people doing, and then compare it to what we can do live in 10 hours. Now, of course it's self-serving because it's not 10 hours, it's being right about architectural decisions over 20 years and, be, and then being expressed in 10, in 10 hours. But the reason it works and the reason it's valuable for people in this room to consider doing that is you must know the state of play and you have to look at it directly. And it is your responsibility to go look at this because if you don't look at it, people around you aren't going to look at it. And I'll tell you something else. Half the world is aligned around some idea that this stuff can't work. That's because they don't have any valuable products. You got to go look at it yourself. Of course, half the people are telling you this can't work. It has to be a PowerPoint. That can't work. Or that, yes, I can tell you, at least in this country, down the road, they're employing a product that does work. And you have to look at it yourself. And anyone is telling you it's not valuable, it's not going to be valuable, or it's only a PowerPoint, probably doesn't have anything to sell. Distrust them, go look at it yourself. Okay, we're running out of time, but just one little question, the last one. If we're in a science fiction movie, how do you see the future of AI? Um, it's, it's undecided. It, it could go either way, but I would say in the near term, the most important thing to make sure. Let me give you a, a, another counterintuitive riff. There, in many developments, technological developments, the, the innovation is taking place five years out. This is a place where the innovation ramp is so great that the most important thing really is what do you do in the next 18 months. Yeah. So like the most important battlefield for this is in the military and what will be decided is can America and its allies get to a point of decisive dominance and then impose regulation on the rest of the world from that perspective of dominance. That would be the best outcome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you. Come.